uh, today's speaker is uh, Professor Shudeshna Sinha, who is a professor and also the deputy director in the Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research in Mohali. And uh, she works in the field of nonlinear physics and chaos, as the title already says. And her work on chaos based hardware, I was pretty impressed by that, called Chaos Computing, is being developed commercially by a US based company. And her work has been recognized in terms of several awards and distinctions. Uh, she is elected fellow of the World Academy of Sciences. She has the Jesse Bose Fellowship, elected fellow of uh, Indian National Science Academy, Indian Academy of Sciences. She was also awarded with the BM Birla Prize in Physics. And uh, she has been, as a student, uh, she got this National Talent Search Scholarship. So with this brief introduction, uh, Shudeshna, the floor is yours. And she is going to talk about harnessing chaos. Okay. Okay, so let me go into presentation mode. And uh, if you want, you could even maybe put on my video. I don't know if that works for you. Okay, uh, so the thing is, uh, so first of course, thank you for this very generous introduction. And uh, I really wish I could have been there in person, uh, but we will go with our new normal of webinars and uh, I hope to at least share some things with you. Okay. Uh, can you, uh, uh, am I audible or is that working? Yes, uh, yes. Oh, oh, you are audible. Oh, hang on, hang on. I think my, uh, okay. I might be doing better now. Am I doing better now? Okay. Ha, ha, ha. You are ha. One request to everybody in the audience, kindly mute your microphone. And uh, you can, if you have a pressing question, you can put in the chat box, which we will take in the question answer session. And of course, you can ask uh, in person during this question answer session. So yes, Shudeshna, please. OK, so I continue. Right. OK, so what I thought I um, will share with you today is one particular research thread. Uh, and this actually is um, an application-oriented thread. It involves complex dynamical systems and some directions towards exploiting what we understand about these systems. I thought I'll choose this particular one over my usually more uh, purely theoretical uh, musings, uh, partly to show that sometimes, you know, these very abstract ideas somehow manage to find a way into applications. And it's fun when it actually manages to do that. OK, so uh, since this is uh, uh, a general audience, I will uh, start with a very shallow crash introduction of the concept of chaos. Okay. And uh, since it's one of the two words in the featured in the title, I felt I should, uh, you know, at least uh, attempt an introduction. Um, my apologies to all the experts in this virtual audience. So for the next 10, 15 minutes, uh, it, it's going to be very elementary. Okay, so what we were going to deal with is classical phenomena. Okay, so which is probably a very polite word for really old, okay, old, old fashioned in some ways. However, what always strikes me as interesting is the, you know, to paraphrase uh, Eugene Wigner, is the unreasonable effectiveness of classical mechanics. Okay, so it somehow stood the test of time. It's, of course, mathematically very rigorous, which is why it's actually a field of mathematics as well. And it gives you a toolkit which appears to work to understand phenomena over an extremely large scale. Okay, so from nanomechanical oscillators to astrophysical objects. And the whole point is it almost has no business working that well. Okay, uh, in, a, in a world which we know is essentially quantum, but it really does work excellently, which is why engineers go to classical mechanics as a uh, very, very often. Uh, now, um, so of course, it's a very old field. That's why it's classical. So what is chaos? In some sense, you can think of it as a new frontier of classical mechanics. So it's the new kid in a very old block. OK, so and uh, what has it offered us? It actually is a, some kind of a paradigm shift, I would think, because it causes us or at least has made us fundamentally reassess the world, way in which we view 
the classical physical world, you know, something which we, we may have thought was obvious or well understood. You know, we have revisited a whole lot of classical phenomena and found very, very new surprising things in there. So what are the surprising things? Why was it even necessitated? Why did we even have to go to a new science or a new uh, theory of classical mechanics? So the surprise was started like this. A very large range of what appeared to be very simple natural processes seemed to exhibit enormously complex behavior. And so complex that sometimes, you know, if you didn't know better, you would think that they were evolving under random forces rather than, you know, nice, neat, deterministic laws. So what gives... Sudeshna, can you hear us? We cannot hear you, Sudeshna. Are you there? Because she changed. Sudeshna, we cannot hear you. Hello. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You are not connected because we have lost. We can see your slides still, but your voice is not there. Yeah, yeah. Now you are now you are out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Network problem. Network problem. Okay, so there is a loss connectivity. How come the slides? The slides are No, slides that to start with actually. That is fine. Into she is now out. We don't see her. Yeah, in the last meeting that was important. That and that was written like this. Please unmute yourself. Your microphone is my too. Microphone can you hear us? Microphone to mute it, sir. Shudeshna, please unmute yourself. You are muted. What the heck? I don't see you, Shudeshna. Sorry, uh, can you hear me now? Huh. Yes, yes. Uh -huh. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, God. So anyway, I mean, uh, well, we will see how far we get. These are the problems with. But now can you see the slide? Or is it like a uh -huh. slide okay. is visible and your voice is hard? OK, OK, let's see. Let's hope we can get past a few things before I lose you again. Anyway, huh. so so let me continue. OK, so. Uh, let me go to presentation mode if I can. Okay, so the whole thing is, uh, I, I don't know whether I probably did say this, that uh, we needed this new sort of a paradigm shift. And um, somehow the word chaos is used in colloquial language, right? We all use it. And uh, in fact, the Webster dictionary meaning of chaos in India, we use a lot. I mean, confused, 
unorganized, disorderly. We are using to describe everything from traffic to politics. It's a very well used, well or maybe abused word. But it actually has an even older etymology. And appear, apparently, it's there even in ancient Greek, meaning some kind of a, a abyss or a, some kind of a emptiness before things came into being. So it's like a pre-order. And my Chinese friends tell me uh, uh, that apparently it's there also in, in old Chinese. And that's one of these symbols out here, which, which uh, uh, they say is a Chinese symbol for chaos. Um, and this also had the same sort of meaning of being, you know, like a pre-order. Uh, pre so it is something which is not maybe the opposite of order, but something which precedes order. But like all things which are, you know, colloquial, uh, it has to, it sort of made a shift into technical uh, scientific vocabulary. And that's interesting because it's kind of recent. It's only in about 1975 or so that the word chaos appears in a scientific paper. So Lee and York, uh, two applied mathematicians in American Mathematical Monthly, wrote this paper, a very seminal paper called Period 3 Implies Chaos. So uh, though one may argue exactly when the word first came into uh, scientific literature, it's often accepted that this is probably the first time people put a sort of technical definition to a word, which we know from, you know, uh, standard usage uh, of, uh, you know, English and apparently even more ancient languages like Greek and Chinese. So what is the key idea? So one of the key ideas was that irregular motion of a dynamical system that is deterministic, sensitive to initial condition, and almost impossible to predict in the long term with anything less than infinite and perfect representation of analog values. So now I have actually put in quite a few words. But what it means is that unless you have a perfect precision in your state variables, whatever prediction you make is going to be wrong sooner or later, and sooner rather than later. And this sort of an idea actually bothered people. And there was a lot of unease, even way back, you know, even uh, from the time of Maxwell, Hadamard. And Poincaré himself, of course, was uh, very, very um, kind of, uh, you know, uh, upset by this whole thing because he was trying a very hard problem, the three-body problem, which apparently was just one step up from the two-body problem, which is in textbooks. But the moment you went up one complexity level, all bets were off, and he threw his hands up. It takes a lot to make Poincaré throw his hands up um, and kind of realize that there is a fundamental problem in here. And this stems from this notion, which is there is determinism on one side, and there is unpredictability on the other. You don't think you're going to use these two words in the same sentence. But this is the point of chaos. It's full of these delicious contradictions. And I've used the, I've also listed Lorenz here. So Lorenz is Ed Lorenz, um, uh, atmospheric uh, physicist from MIT. And his paper does not have the word chaos, but in some sense flags this issue in numerical simulations. So these were early computers. And he sort of realized how enormously sensitive all his orbits were to the tiniest amount of difference in initial condition precision. So whether when he went from 32 bit to 64 bits, he got an entirely different result. So this is what people suddenly woke up that this is classical mechanics. You ought to have known it perfectly, but somehow you have unpredictably built into it. You have not put in noise, but still you have it. So I'll attempt a simple, slightly imprecise definition of uh, chaos. So I will put it as sustained, disorderly looking, aperiodic, long term evolution. Okay. And owing to great sensitivity to small changes in initial conditions, this behavior is so unpredictable that it often appears random. So that is the contradiction that it is a perfectly deterministic system, which appears if you didn't know better, to be random. And it's sometimes popularly dubbed as the butterfly effect. So it was made uh, popularized by Ian Stewart in uh, Does God Play Dice? The Mathematics of Chaos. So uh, it helped people visualize this 
small changes bringing about drastic effects by saying if a butterfly flaps its wind, wings in Brazil, you know, a tornado pops up in Texas. So it's just a slightly uh, overstated way of uh, saying uh, this extreme sensitivity to initial conditions changes the outcome very drastically very soon. Of course, the precise signature of chaos is a positive Lyapunov exponent. I will not put it down exactly here, but uh, it is a, a quantitative kind of uh, signature which tells you on an average how fast two infinitesimally close trajectories fly apart in phase space. So it tells you how these outcomes uh, become extremely different extremely soon in some ways. Okay, and now, of course, this concept of chaos has even caught up in popular imagination. It's part of common folklore. And, you know, uh, there are bestsellers and there are even uh, Hollywood movies. So once there's Hollywood movies, you've really broken into popular psyche. So uh, uh, that's the fun part. And of course, I think lots of us have these nice, pretty screensavers, which are essentially generated from nonlinear maps like or Julia sets or something. So they are all, all dynamical systems, deterministic, but with extreme uh, amount of uh, features. So I thought I'll, I'll show two simple systems because it's a colloquium, you know, it's, it's not as much about my work as it is, you know, about the background in which it all fits. So, uh, so that you sort of, you know, for people uh, who are not experts in the audience. Uh, so I thought I'll put up two simple one uh, systems which display chaos. And I have been keeping on saying that in order to show chaos, you don't have to be complicated. So if you did something very complicated and got something very complicated, you might say, okay, what's in there? But what, what I want to show you in the next two slides are two very simple systems. So the first, this one has a one dimensional system. Can't get simpler than that. There's just a variable x. OK, it's a real number. And these systems I've put down here are what are called maps. So the time here is discrete. So it is it, the evolution of the system is given where you take your um, uh, uh, state, put it through a function, and generate the next thing. So it's like a stroboscopic uh, picture of your time evolution. The first one is the famous logistic map. It was uh, inspired by mathematical biology. There's a very lovely Robert May uh, article in Nature, uh, 86, I think, where uh, it's, it's, it's introduced. Uh, I mean, it's not introduced, but discussed in a, in a very, very nice way, an elementary way. So this is, if you look at it mathematically, it's very simple because there's a linear term. And then there is one nonlinear term, which is a quadratic term. So if you had to make something nonlinear, you put in a quadratic term, next nonlinearity. So in some sense, it's the simplest nonlinear system you can think of. Okay, So you can imagine you could actually iterate this on a pocket calculator if people don't have those things anymore. But OK, mobile phone, maybe. It's that simple. Okay, The second map is, is looks even simpler. It's called the binary shift map. So this one can be proved to be chaotic in a very rigorous way. And this one is actually as if it is made out of two linear parts. So it's 2x, but mod 1. So you cut whatever comes out of the interval 1, and you paste it back into the interval. So it's like two lines. So it's piecewise linear. And the second one, it's written like this. But if you plotted it, you would see that it's it has two, again, piecewise linear. But it looks like a tent. So it's called a tent map. So it has two straight lines, but they kind of join like a tent. Very simple systems, OK? One with quadratic, one with two piecewise linear. And this is the time series you get out of it. So if you had sort of not known that I'd use such a simple generator for this thing, you may might have thought I was just putting in some random numbers and getting this object, OK? So though it looks so complex, it is actually generated by this perfectly deterministic, simple equation which is just ticking like clockwork at the background. But it is generating this completely uh, difficult to understand, aperiodic, disorderly, seemingly random uh, time series. And the action which you can think of mathematically of these objects are twofold, actually. One is like a stretch. So that is what takes neighboring uh, you know, trajectories and pushes them, you know, throws them apart. So they fly apart exponentially fast. That's the stretch operation. But if two 
trajectories, you know, were just running away from each other exponentially fast. Both of them would reach infinity. What's what's so interesting about that? The interesting part is because they are folded back. So there is a fold operation. Sorry, there's a fold operation which brings the trajectory back into the same space. So it is like you're locally flying apart and then you're forced to live back in the same space. It's like in a lot of human condition, I suppose. And then you so things get very complicated because of these two contradictory things. And here is the second one I thought I'd show. Um, this is a 2D map. Again, very simple because x is just 2x and plus y and y is just x plus y. Again, mod. So the mod operation, whatever stretch there is, it cuts and pastes it back into the box. So it takes it, cuts it up and folds it back into the box. So here is the operation. It This is just one iterate. So here is a picture. Uh, this was uh, stolen from University of Maryland, and it's called a cat map. So they put a very cute cat in there. Then this one is stretched, and uh, still it's a recognizable stretched cat. But then the mod operation does something violent to the cat. It cuts it up and folds it back into the box, one, uh, zero, one, zero, one box, because it's a mod one. And in one iteration, the cat looks like this not recognizable, very mangled. And that is the power of the chaotic operation, where it can take anything and in no time at all, it's unrecognizable. OK, so just to give you how a simple thing makes such a big difference. So now to, to you know indicate what I wanted to share quickly with you all is how do we proceed from here? So in some sense, now I would think that this field has progressed enough, understanding has accumulated, and maybe now there is a good time to use this new knowledge. So here is classical mechanics. Here are so many classical systems we know and love and use every day. So can one use this new knowledge now? Because you know, in the beginning, the whole effort was to understand. But as understanding keeps developing, I think you can probably flip the question and say, you know, ask not what you can do for chaos, but what, ca what chaos can do for you. So that is the whole idea. So one can use these words, you know, let us uh, use chaos, let us harness chaos, and they are all nice words. But in order to do anything, especially one which you want to sell to an engineer uh, who wants things all pakka, is that you have to tell them a way, a procedure, a prescription to use all this nice richness. It's wonderful. It's all very complicated. But you have to be able to use it in a direct way and in an efficient way. OK, so I'll show two, two strategies today. And um, one of them is the use of controlled chaos. So what would I try? I would try in this to extract a wide range of patterns from the nonlinear dynamics. OK, I know that all the patterns are sitting in there, but I would I want to give you a strategy to extract it from there. OK, I've just put the first two papers in there. There's lots after that. But these are the ones where the idea was first there. So I have put them there. And the second one would be to use noise. So noise we know is everywhere. So, so far it's been deterministic, but at the end, I will also say that, okay, you throw in noise because you can't avoid it. You have to confront it. So then this whole complicated interplay between noise and nonlinearity, you might think will mess up things, but is there some way to again turn, the, turn it around and make it work for you? That would be the idea. So let me get on with it. So I'll put the control scheme, which uh, which is a sort of ours. So I, I like it. Um, it's also very simple. Since a lot of you do computations and a lot of you write many complicated programs, I wrote it as an if-then statement. So all this control scheme does is this. Here is a trajectory, which is running around, very complicated. But any time it exceeds some prescribed threshold, it's like a Lakshman Rekha. You say, I pull it back. So x is reset to the level, and that is all we do. So much of the time, the trajectory is happily doing its own thing. But every time it's exceeding the bounds, you pull it back and reset it. So if I had to give it a broad name, a broad principle, I would call it a dynamic range limiter. It's actually very simple to implement. Of course, in the program, it's one line. But even in real life, as I found out later, it is actually a, one of the simpler uh, control methods which one can implement. 
And what is the action? Okay, you've done this, but do you get something out of it? What it does is it takes the chaotic dynamics and clips it or cuts it and pastes it into exact cycles. So it these sequences, which were all complicated, so it takes bits and pieces of it, cuts it, pastes it, and makes desired patterns out of it. And each of these patterns are now stable. In fact, actually, we can prove that they're super stable. That part you needn't worry about. Ne? But why is chaos even helping? I mean, after all, you know, it was a messy thing. Why are you even going there? You could have just suppressed it all and tried to get a you know fixed state. But the thing is that if you could manage to use it, the chaos, the dynamics itself has all these patterns. So the more patterns it has embedded in it, the more you can get out of it. So if you can clip different, different sections of it, you will be able to generate a whole more patterns than you could say out of a two cycle, which went, you know, state one, state two, or a fixed point. What can you do with it? it can only be that. Whereas chaos, because it's doing all this, you can control it to different patterns. So that is the basic idea here. Okay. So what one can do is to obtain what is called a lookup table. This is the one which, of course, engineers look for. But the nice part here is that this lookup table we could generate uh, actually analytically. So one could do all the hard work, all the analysis in the background, and then give them this lookup table. What does the lookup table say? It says, I'm giving you a correspondence, threshold on one side, and controlled period or cycle on the other side. Now, this particular set here I've put is for the chaotic logistic map, which I showed you, which was a mess. But as I put different thresholds, I can get the chaotic map to be something else. So either it's a fixed point, if I put threshold less than half, if it's between half and 0 0.809, it's period two, that is just goes x1, x2, x1, x2, or it becomes period four, which cycles over four values, six, seven, nine. There's I mean, this is a long table of literally every periodicity which one can get actually analytically. And one could also show that this chaotic system can be trapped in a super stable cycle, which means it's very robust the instant it, it exceeds threshold. So it, there's not much transience. So fata fat it gets caught and sticks there forever. So what do we get out of it? we get what I could, would call a flexible pattern generator. Because this threshold you can give at will. So if I want, to want this module to be fixed point, I give something. If I want it to be a two cycle, I give it something. So in hand, I've got a pattern generator. It's a very powerful object. So that was from theory. But I was uh, you know, shopping for uh, experimentalists who would do this. And uh, I, I ended up finding one absolutely in my neighborhood, uh, uh, Murali, who's very, very good with electronic circuits. And so he got the first proof of principle uh, verification of, of that analysis. And uh, this, these are oscilloscope traces. And exactly corresponding to what we told him analytically, if when he set the threshold, he got his fixed point. This is a four cycle, four points, tuck, tuck, tuck. This actually, I think, was an eight cycle. And this is a 10 cycle. Okay, so it just cycles between these points. So these are from, from the traces of the oscilloscope, some, some pictures to, to tell you if there is something sitting on your tabletop, uh, you can actually still put in your analysis and it will still give the cycles which you were expecting. <clears throat> this is, of course, a bulky experiment in the sense, you know, it sits on the table, uh, but people have worked over the years to get niftier versions of it. And I think the latest one, I think there's something else, but I saw this one from the Murai group in Japan, and uh, he had on a on a chip, uh, uh, he had put in I think 124 such little maps, uh, su such systems, and uh, he managed to threshold uh, control it into patterns of of a huge variety. So he managed to have controlled patterns from this chip which not just had one, uh, but had 124 of these. So now he has a little pattern generator on a chip. Uh, so uh, I don't know how they do it. It's, uh, you know, I'm a theorist, but it's fun when, uh, when you tell them and they manage to do it. Huh? So they are the wizards in this. Okay, so I thought I'll go through three or four, uh, just like a slideshow to tell you that uh, it works for many different systems. Here is a nonlinear, so they all have to be nonlinear, otherwise, of course, there's no chaos. Uh, this is a third order differential system, 
and uh, uh, these are again oscilloscope traces. They look a bit different, so I've put it. So this scroll is a chaotic scroll. If you look at it carefully, it is a bit messy. It will never become a perfect circle. But you can do threshold control. And so if you do that, you start generating these nice, perfect cyclic orbits. So here is one, here is another, here is yet another, and you can get many more. So basically, you can get these temporal patterns uh, out of this chaotic system. Here is another one, well-loved double scroll Chua circuit, which I think may be in various people's labs for students. And here is this control. So this is like a, you know, like a butterfly. It has two scrolls and is completely chaotic. Whereas if you put a control, it goes and sits either at a fixed point or makes these nice, neat uh, cycles on one side of the scroll, and uh, you can get control again. So just to show that it works over many different systems. We also tried what is called a hyper chaotic system. Uh, hyper anything is more of whatever it is. And this is actually a technical term. So if it doesn't make sense, uh, you can let it slide. But all it means is that it has more than one positive Lyapunov exponent, which is just another way of saying it has more than one unstable directions. So why did we want to try it? We wanted to try it because we are putting this limiter, this clipping on one variable, some x, or maybe we choose y. But what if there are lots of directions which are unstable, lots of directions which are flying apart exponentially? Will one clipping in one variable cut it? Or will it just not work? So that is why we tried it. And uh, well, I thought it would fail, but actually it worked. And this is also from the experiment. Uh, and uh, it generated controlled orbits. So it seems to really be a, a, a very nice method to get patterns. OK, so now we've got some patterns. I shall, in the next 5, 10 minutes, try to use it for something. So I'm sure there are lots of other things one can use it for. For instance, for storing data, I've, you know, and there are some other ideas which I haven't fully worked out, but I, I think they are there. But let me introduce the one which I have worked out. So the idea was, now that we have this pattern generator, can we use this to do something which everyone feels wants to do, which is a computational task, or try to make a computing machine which is which has more flexibility than a regular hardware? Okay, so basically, you would like it to have a module which would be able to give different logic functionalities uh, by a simple change of a threshold, for instance. So. Here is what we have, chaos for computation. So hardware is these threshold activated chaotic elements, which we can think of as a chaotic chip or a chaotic processor. And what is the programming of that? Is to fix the thresholds such that whatever logic operation we want is performed with 100% satisfaction. Okay. So and what is a logic operation? It is a function which relates certain inputs to an output. So that correspondence has to come out of this system. OK. And actually, uh, though there's a short version here and a long version here, I think the best version was written by Wyatt Gibbs in Scientific American, uh, which is uh, you know a little bit popular. But I think he wrote it better than we did. <clears throat> anyway, so uh, here was the aim. I need something which has the ability to switch between these operational roles. And if they manage to do it, it would give you a more dynamic architecture. And you could have a general purpose device, but it'll be more flexible. That is the idea. That is the hope. So let me illustrate it with one, one object. Okay. So here is the good old chaotic map, the logistic map with quadratic, just you know, Rx, 1 minus x squared. Okay, nothing more than that. I want to see if I can make it be a flexible logic gate. First in theory. So let me say the input is just x is there, my initial state, and I just add i1 and i2. i1 and i2 is given by the user from the outside world. I give you one some i1, i2, and see what happens. And the output is just this. If it is greater than some threshold, it is 1. If it's less, it is 0. And what do I want? What I want is all put in, in this truth table. 
while these inputs, this I1 comes here, this I2 comes here, it should spit out an O which follows these. So this sort of binary output should come out of this particular system. So, so I want these truth tables of the basic logic operations to hold. OK. Now, if I want to do it, what do I have to do mathematically? So what I need to do is just this. I will need to satisfy this set of equations simultaneously. These are actually the necessary and sufficient conditions for this truth table here to hold, all of them. Because I want all the operations. I'm greedy. I want all the logic operations to work with this one function. And now this is, I think, is the bottom line. Robust solutions exist only when a system is sufficiently nonlinear. So you cannot get, they just cannot satisfy these equations unless you are have a sufficiently nonlinear system. And often, sufficiently nonlinear systems are chaotic. So a, a way to easily understand it is that the richness of the dynamics allows you actually to select out these different responses from the same module. And nonlinear dynamics has the richness, which you saw, and it also has the determinism. So you can do the calculation backwards and set the right thresholds. Okay. Uh, and this is Keologics, which has been uh, developing this uh, implementation over you know whole bunch of patterns. And it has a chip. Uh, I think it's done better now, and it's sold off to another company. You know, I, I never understand how. Uh, these companies work. But anyway, uh, this is its its current, uh, uh, the, the, the last time I looked. And uh, various people seem to think from the engineering side that it has um, promise. And as I said, never uh, as a theorist did I think I would come in MIT technology review, uh, because the idea was completely abstract and uh, completely analytically doable. Anyway, so this was uh, the way to think of it. Now, in the next 10 minutes, uh, I thought I'd uh, switch gears a little bit and look at another thing. Nonlinearity is a constant through everything, because nonlinear dynamics is what I do. I, mean, I can't leave it anywhere. But I am now pushing into the territory of stochastic systems. So what would happen if I had noise to some level and nonlinearity? So of course, what happened was, as we started doing this, people kept asking me questions in, in various forum. Uh, what if, you know, after all, now all these computational devices and platforms are shrinking? So you are going to encounter fundamental noise characteristics. You can't, can't wish to be suppressed. They can't be eliminated. You have to live with it. So is there something uh, which, you know, you can do with it? So of course, you can keep trying to eliminate it. So we thought we would try another route. Let us see if there is some noise which can work for us. So that was the idea. And why did we think of this? Because of previous work on stochastic resonance. So this, this sort of, uh, there were a lot, there were results which indicated that noise and dynamics could have a cooperative effect. And when they come together, their interplay can give counterintuitive physical phenomena. And so basically what happens is that you could add an appropriate amount of noise and it could boost something which is a signal because the usual understanding is noise kills signal. Noise is the, you know, uh, is the opponent of, of signal, so in that sense. But here you want to use a bit of noise to boost signal and facilitate detection. And actually, as it happened, Engineers have been doing it forever. But in a sense, we were a bit late to the party and we hadn't quite understood the basis of it. So uh, what we thought we would do, this the engineers had not done, is to look for some reliability in your logic circuit elements, which somehow exploit nonlinearity in the presence of a noise floor. So noise floor is a given can't escape. But if you have nonlinear elements, which you need for these kind of threshold things, uh, can we somehow enhance your operation or your functionality? 
And if we could do that, this would, you know, hopefully again, give a device uh, which would maybe work better in the presence of noise. And hopefully if you understand it, even if you don't manage to get it to work better, you could design and develop concepts uh, to handle the noise better. Okay, so uh, what we did was, so this is a one line summary of it, and I'll uh, show you a few uh, uh, results, uh, pictures in a minute, is that we took the nonlinear system, which had many stable states. So now nonlinear, but not chaos, but nonlinear. And we gave it a stream of input signals. That's what the outside world gives it, the user gives it. And what we found was, so the bottom, you know, the bottom line up front, as they say, so I'll, is this is what we found. What we found was in an optimal band of noise, the output consistently gave a logical combination of input signals. And we call this logical stochastic resonance. Okay. And so, so basically what happened? If it's too little noise, no good. Too much noise, obviously no good. But there is a sweet spot in the middle, a large band actually, where it is really extremely, extremely reliable. So that was the idea. So if you, if I, a very simple thing to run down to the to the uh, pictures in a minute. So if you take a nonlinear system, very very general, just put a f of x which has wells, you know, some distinct energy wells. Now I drive it with a low uh, amplitude uh, signal. Remember, it's low amplitude. It's it's below the threshold, sub threshold, uh, and so because we want to have low amplitude, we're giving big results, right? We we that's that's the hope, and uh, this is a a periodic, you know, because it is given by the outside. There is no whatever comes comes, and it's a three level waveform. So for instance, you can have a cubic nonlinearity, and you have two wells. And here is a little schematic of it. Here are the input bits coming in. Here is noise, whatever there is. Here is your nonlinear system. And the nonlinear system switches up and down between the wells, giving your binary logic output. So for instance, you can declare one well to be 0, one well to be 1, whichever way. And every time it toggles, it jumps from one well to another. Okay, But it has to switch exactly in accordance with the truth tables of your logic operation. It can't just do the standard thing which be, uh, a noisy system does, which is you know, it jumps back and forth. That is not going to cut it. It has to jump only in accordance to the truth table. That is the hard part. Okay. And this, even if you know everything else is forgotten, I just hope uh, you just carry back this one picture with you. So here is. Uh, this was uh, also done experimentally, uh, but this one I think was the simulation. Uh, so here are three noise levels of the system. And this little staircase here uh, is the input signal. Okay, And how the system jumps in response to it is going to give you your 0, 1 output. So here say 0, up there is 1. So if it jumps from here, it, it your output 0 goes to 1, and 1 goes back to 0. Now, the response to this has to be consistent. So for instance, here it's not. It has got stuck somewhere at the bottom here, and the same input level, it's got stuck on top. This is no good, because it means that if noise is too small, it is not responding at all to some inputs. So that is no good. You want to give it enough so that it can respond. Now let's see the other bad limit, which is too much noise. There it's just a mess. So it's you know jumping back and forth, sometimes a bit in this well, sometimes there. So this, again, is not workable for anything which is applied. However, right in the middle here, it jumps back and forth completely consistently. And depending on, on various things, which I've not said, it could be a completely consistent or nor or and nand gate. So that is the basic thing. So if I had to say it, uh, you know, one more time, the crucial observation is that the logic output is consistent only in the optimal window of noise. Okay, and this is actually a fairly broad, moderate window of noise. And uh, uh, in a sense, it's a little bit of a surprise, uh, but it is an interesting surprise. And it is something which we can make 
work for us because given a noise floor, you can engineer your system so that it sits in the right spot. I should also mention here, since part of my thing was this flexible, reconfigurable logic gates, we can do the same here as well. We can add a small bias term, it's just a constant term, a DC asymmetrizing uh, uh, constant. And this actually just changes the symmetry of the well and allows us to morph between, say, NOR, OR, and NAND and functions. So here is, a, is actually this, these two pictures took me forever to calculate because each thing here is a, is a, a probability measure over hundreds and hundreds of runs from all kinds of um, uh, random streams of inputs just to see that the probability of obtaining the logic operations is indeed close to one. Because unless it's close to one, no one would like to touch it. And so these bright spots in here are one. So that's a very nice uh, operational regime. And the thing is, it's it's quite wide. You know, it's not so bad. And so on one side, I have given the noise. On the other side, I have put this bias. And OK, so this side is noise, x-axis. Y-axis is that constant bias. And this one says that I operate very nicely as NAND or AND. And this says I can operate very nicely as OR or NOR. Okay, so it can just morph between these by simply adjusting this bias. Very easy to do in, especially in circuits. So I thought I'd show two or three pictures from things which are not circuits, uh, uh, and uh, they are done in the labs of other people. Uh, but they, so essentially, as I said, I mean we can sell the idea to people who have, uh, you know very nice experimental setups and see if they will uh, you know, take your idea up and do it. And indeed, Mohanty's lab uh, in Boston did this particular experiment with nanomechanical uh, oscillators. And uh, so these are uh, uh, kind of, he wanted to make a noise-assisted reprogrammable nanomechanical logic gate uh, from the stuff actually he already had in his lab, which was a single crystal silicon, uh, which he had uh, you know, using e-beam lithography, uh, had fabricated into these uh, oscillators. Okay. So this is uh, from his experiment. We are also on it because essentially, you know, we were in on the idea. And here is what he got. So this side is the AND, and this is the OR. Small bias, as, as said before. And the first one is low noise. Again, sometimes it jumps, sometimes it doesn't. Not good. Here, of course, it's jumping whenever it wants, which is also bad. So here it doesn't respond to you. Here it has a mind of its own. Right here, it is faithfully following the input to give the exact truth table that you want to come out of it. And that, again, is an experimental verification of the idea. So uh, one, one more uh, small application. And this was um, uh, using synthetic genetic networks. Uh, again, complicated, but still no chaos in that, but still non-linear, uh, and had two wells. Uh, and uh, I like it partly because uh, I really like this cover art which that artist did. These are null clients, um, and who knew null clients could look like Mondria or Kandinsky or whatever? Uh, these artists are really good. Uh, so, But I, I like the picture, so I have put it up there. So what? what uh, there were lots of things in that. I'll just uh, flag one result. And this result is this one, is that, uh, you know, there is this thing that suppose I have a higher dimensional system, you know, from X, I have X and Y, you know, like two variables, three variables. Uh, are we just uh, losing things in complexity or can we get something out of it? So what we tried to show here was that if you had these two uh, networks in tandem, we could actually get two complementary gate operations out of it. Or we could actually get two entirely different gate operations out of it in parallel, in so simultaneously. So basically, you can parallelize your operation if you had more variables to play around with. So it's not always a bad thing if your system had a little more complexity. You could try to use that complexity to get parallelized operation. So this was the bottom line of this particular. There are other things, but I like to uh, uh, highlight just this one. 
And uh, later on, Ed Helen uh, managed to get an electronic analog of this. Uh, it was not as easy as the other ones. Uh, he had to work a bit hard. A student, I think, even got a PhD out of it. Um, but again, the bottom line is exactly that. Here is low noise. You can see that either it's stuck on top or it's stuck at the bottom. This gives no output. But at moderate noise, it is switching exactly like you want it. So too much switch is bad, too little switch is bad. Moderate noise is good, as said before. And there are a couple of. Uh, popular articles on it, uh, which, uh, as always, some of these things explain uh, maybe not accurate, all overstated, of course. I mean, you know, it's popular, but uh, it's still nice to read. And uh, I think I, the focus article is a bit probably nicer than this one. I, I shouldn't show my preference, but they are both quite nice. Uh, other groups have been also trying to do things like this. Uh, and indeed, uh, I don't know, the hundreds of them, uh, at least 100 of them, uh, which I have uh, seen. But I've just put a few of them. So in theory, for instance, people are trying colored noise. People are trying time delay. People are trying to formalize it with uh, bit error rates and more information-based measures, trying to uh, Everyone has been calling it this logical stochastic resonance. Whatever name we had given in the beginning has stuck. Um, so, uh, And uh, also getting maybe from bistable going to tristable or multistable of higher order uh, systems. And in uh, experiments they have been doing in electronics, in uh, uh, optics, uh, this is a very nice group of Christina Masuler who has been uh, doing some stuff on, on, um, on these uh, vexels. And uh, some people have been uh, doing it on even thin films and micro mechanical. I, honestly, I don't know what they do. I, I've just listed these because some of the experiments, I, I wish I understood more, but I don't. But at the end, when I see the uh, figure, I know they have done a realization of the concept. So that's why I like it, uh, though I understand it, the work of other groups imperfectly, for sure. I understand the theory. I don't understand all the experiments. Huh? Uh, so the last five minutes, I uh, I can t I, I'll just take five more minutes and I'll wrap up. Promise. Um, so in the last five minutes, I wanted to make a little link between the first part and the second part. So the first part, I said chaos, and I was using patterns in chaos, trying to get a flexible hardware. Second part, I said nonlinearity is there, but they were stable states. So they were. It was a nonlinear potential with multiple stable states, but they were still fixed points. So no chaos in that. Nonlinearity was there, but no chaos. So now I want to see, can I sort of uh, extend the idea to marry these two concepts? So there will be chaos now as a chaotic attractor, but chaotic attractor sitting in different parts of phase space. Now this some of us know and like a lot because we have seen in many situations that dynamical systems have switched between these different, very complicated chaotic attractors sitting in different parts of phase space. OK, and now we want to kind of um, combine these features and get reliable logic operations by cha chaotic attractor hopping. Okay? So here is just a picture. There are these two chaotic attractors, this sitting nicely in this quadrant, this one sitting here. And what it does is in re response to all our uh, inputs is it jumps from here to there. So this one gives a 1, this one gives 0. So it gives a logic output in response to the inputs. And the mechanism now is hopping not through wells, not through two stable states hopping between each other, even with noise, so noisy stable state, noisy stable state, but actually a full chaotic attractor hopping to another chaotic attractor. That is the idea. OK. And why is this a little bit nice? What we found was that the input signal now could be seriously small. So the output is the size of the attractor, which says order one. And the input signal was 10 to the power minus three. So it was responding to really, really small changes with a very significant dynamical outcome. So people like that. People like a small change to drive a large output. And sometimes people have been calling it, we didn't, it's not in the paper, but uh, other people have been calling it that these are what are called tipping points. So essentially, a small change gives rise to a big effect. 
And in dynamics, sometimes it's hazardous or dangerous and avoidable. But here we are trying to utilize it. And uh, my second last or some such slide is, is here. And uh, so basically, now with this idea of tipping attractors, if you add noise, do we get a generalized logical stochastic resonance? So can we again have an optimal noise to get best uh, logic responses? OK, so whatever held for the stable uh, attractor, now can we do it for periodic cycles or chaotic attractors, more complex attractors? And the answer is yes. And here is a uh, experiment which again shows that moderate noise is good, uh, small noise is not effective, and large noise is not reliable. So summarizing slide here before I go to my last slide is that the noise flow now can aid the reliability of the logic operations, even when the logic operation is based on you know, switching between more complex states. So it's a generalized logical stochastic resonance. And the amplitude of the logic input signal could be very low. Actually, I don't know how this we have not figured out. It was even smaller than the noise strength in his experiment. Okay, So it's not, not just in the simulation. So I think his input signal was about 10 millivolts. And, uh, I think he gave about like a one, uh, oh, sorry, that's millivolt. I, I made a, a error in my typo, a typo error there. So that was about 100 times smaller, actually. I made a small mistake there. Oh, no, 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 sorry. No, no, it's OK. It's, it's one volt. No, it's correct, correct. Sorry, it is 100 times smaller, correct. So so basically, this, is, this was very, very strange. Uh, it was working in experiments. And I don't know, I, I haven't actually understood why, so I am admitting that I don't quite know why it works as well as it is working. But it's it's something which I think is, is very promising. And uh, so we can get very low amplitude, sorry, very low amplitude uh, inputs to give highly amplified outputs. So this is my last slide. I'll uh, leave you with this uh, before I take questions. So this is, well, the broad outlook and outreach, maybe, of the ideas. Um, in the so we have basically shown in at least in the last part that you can hop between dynamical attractors of different geometries and you can implement logic gates <clears throat> and this last part uh, combined uh, chaos computing and logical stochastic resonance but there was something in the beginning which i haven't put in the summary slide so the last point here is you know is a wrap up idea of all the all the parts so basically, what did we try? We tried to exploit chaos, all the temporal patterns embedded in it, as well as try to exploit the interplay of noise and nonlinearity. And we tried to do something with it. And, and the something was the design of computing devices, which could be more flexible, more, uh, uh, more uh, reconfigurable than the usual stuff. Okay, so that I, I leave you there, and uh, I am uh, open for questions. Thank you, Shudeshna, for a very oh. nice and educative introduction. Are there questions from the audience, the online audience? Okay. Are there questions or comments from the online audience? I see some of the students. Yes, uh, Yes, I see. Purnabrata, can you please unmute yourself and ask the question? Can you hear me now? Uh, yes. I can hear you. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for the nice talk. So uh, I'm not sure whether I got it correctly, but uh, can you please go back to your slide, I think, 32 where you talked about the this uh, some Langevin type of equation with uh, noise. OK, uh, let me see, 32, OK. Yeah, uh, I think roughly I remember 32. Uh, oh, wow, you remember more than me. Huh? Uh, the 32, I think, was this. So uh, maybe the equation before that, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, somewhere yeah. here, maybe this one? Yeah, yeah, right, right, right. Ah, right, 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 right. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I is, I guess, uh, the input signal. That is the input signal. Yeah, that and is what X, is given from the outside. That is not in right, our hands. Right, right. Uh -huh. And X is the expo, uh, input. That output. is the system. That is the uh, so f of x is is your basic uh, dynamical right. system. So that right. gives uh, uh, yeah. And uh, X you get the output. 
and from the x we get the output yeah so so right. basically uh, so this is so this is a particular f of x uh, is uh, 2x uh, and, so, and this is the i which that we have no control because whatever they give us you know the world gives us gives us and uh, yes so uh, this is the x this is you know uh, so uh, so here for instance uh, this this binary logic output part this is the x mm -hmm. which is in response to these uh, i's here right no so so my question is that uh, huh. ideally of course you would like uh, your uh, output to follow i mean what you desire but in the presence of noise uh, i guess most of the time you get get it right but there are some rare excursions maybe that you get it wrong i mean uh, is it is possible <laughs> right, right? Right. Uh, right right so of course i mean so, so that is the main uh, main question right that in the presence of noise uh, what is the probability that there are these right. rare excursions which yes. is exactly yes. your question so um, now what i didn't show you which is the hardest uh, uh, i mean which was the most labor intensive part of the work was that we uh, had a very rigorous uh, probability measure where mm -hmm. every single uh, um, permutation combination of a random run had to give the right result with 100% accuracy. So if it failed right. even once, we would say failed run. And right. there was a point in a in, uh, thing leaving. A, uh, so there is a little bit of latency. So there is like, you know, when it switches for a short time, there is a mm -hmm. bit of latency. Leaving that latency, it was 100%. So we did it over like uh, 10 to the power four runs, actually. Uh, um, so uh, it was uh, it was amazingly good. That is the whole point. Uh, I mean, um, no, but theoretically it, it cannot be hundred percent. So that uh, no, no, no. Theoretically, there's a tail, right? I mean, so of course there is there is. So the point is here that given this and uh, uh, so so obviously it is over. Some, so the probability of that is so low. Right, that okay. is an acceptable uh, uh, okay. see, after all every every machine that you have has a has a small probability of, of failure yeah. right uh, but if that is you know less than uh, some extremely small amount so basically within our um, uh, calculation it was lower than 10 to the power minus 5 in some some units so which was uh, taken to be a very good uh, uh, error rate actually uh, okay, but, so uh, uh, a small second question maybe. So I right. think that way, uh, I mean that uh, accuracy you get by tuning your strength of the noise. Maybe uh, am I right? Correct. Yes. So so of course. Uh, uh, so uh, basically, uh, as we sweep the noise, this accuracy becomes uh, really good in a in a band uh, of noise. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, uh, I don't know if you were asking me the question, but the hard question someone could ask is that actually you are given a noise, right? I mean, noise is what it is. Um, so then the thing is that you can also vary the constant bias or some other parameters of the design system to make its operational uh, region match with whatever is your ambient noise. So suppose you say my ambient noise is to be in this range, then you design it so that your bright spot, that sweet spot comes and sits there. That is, that okay. is very easily done actually. Huh? Uh, okay, not so hard. Uh -huh. okay. Are there other questions or comments from the audience? Well, I don't see anything. Shudeshna, I have a question. Uh, yes. Hello. Uh, yes, yes, I can hear you. Huh? Huh? Yeah, so it's, it's kind of a very general question. Yeah. So, uh, of course, we are more interested in scientific computing. So, mm -hmm. what is the advantage of the chaos computing over the conventional computing when it comes to the question of scientific thing? Right. I mean, so, of course, this is completely, I mean, this question is hard because uh, in some sense, um, Right now, we are more or less in the stage where you want to develop the hardware. So it is a, so whatever. So you're usually when people do scientific, it's more in the software thing because given a, a machine, you write the best possible program for it. So uh, this is like trying to design a particular machine. So one of the things is that uh, we were trying to position ourselves was that. Um, FPGAs have been uh, uh, again one of those you know programmable. Um, uh, computing uh, platform so in yeah. some sense there uh, you would uh, try to adjust the connections in order to get the flexibility 
So here we were saying that you can also uh, change the functionality to get the flexibility. So you would get more flexibility. So if you could get like FPGAs, you, if you can program it, you would be able to do better. I don't think, uh, to be honest, I think it is going to go more towards, uh, you know, specialized functions. So, for instance, the people who have bought this company want to use it as a special chip in a cell phone for something. I don't know how broad based it's going to be, to be honest. Uh, but, uh, no, but the idea is a bit like an FPGA and a bit like an ASIC also, as in like you could probably program it for a special task to be absolutely optimized for it. Okay. Um, uh, so far, most of our uh, software is made for any hardware. We don't uh, try to uh, tune it so much to the hardware, uh, you know. Uh, so uh, I, so I still don't know if I can give an honest answer to that. Uh, but uh, so it is still more or less in the developmental stage of trying to be. Uh, uh, so, for instance, I mean, I, I think more uh, a bit like maybe quantum computing or something. It is not, I don't think it can replace what we have. However, you can make a module which can be the part where you need the flexibility. So that's what people were saying that they needed it for a certain uh, specialized function and they tuned, tuned it for that function. So it could sit in, in your broader thing. So, you know, your computer is used as is most of the time, but when it needs that flexibility, it can access that module. I mean, so you you know, I, uh, uh, this was the hope. So uh, a hybrid platform. A bit hybrid, exactly. I think that is the uh, that would be the practical way of looking at it. I think that's the practical way of looking at all alternate uh, computing uh, devices. Because sometimes I sit in, you know, the quantum computing people also are there because everyone is alternate. Uh, but we all know that we are not replacing anything <laughs> right now. Uh, but uh, we can be good modules which can be add-ons. Actually, it's a bit easier for us because we are realized in, in conventional uh, silicon. So it is it's much easier, but still, I would say it's, uh, you know, somewhere between FPGAs and ASICs, we are uh, trying to position ourselves. Yeah. Okay. I, let's see. <laughs> okay. Yeah. okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, here, yeah. any further questions? I'm sorry, there was so much of a glitch in the beginning. I don't know what I, I lost in the beginning. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. I think that was not exactly uh, it, only for one slide. There was okay, a, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. So, okay. okay, so I don't see any more hands raised. So thank you once again for a very nice introduction to a very fascinating subject. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Hope to be in person there sometime huh? <laughs> to meet all of you. Huh? Okay. Sure. okay. Bye. Sure. Huh? Bye. I log out then. I also do hope we can welcome you in the SNPO Center in person, not live. Yeah, here. right. I know it would be much more fun to meet everybody. <laughs> okay. Okay. Bye then. Huh? Okay. Oh, bye. Oh, bye.